Considering the issues related to astronomical societies previously explored, it's no wonder that there are concerns around the ethics to construct space facilities. But how did we end up here? Mm. Is space destined to only be accessible to scientists or the mega rich? Or does there exist many ways in which the world's diverse societies and cultures connect to the cosmos? The issues explored at scientific facilities in the previous lecture are a part of a much bigger problem we will explore in this lecture. We'll briefly examine the geopolitics of space by considering how Western societies treat space compared to indigenous communities. So the term outer space was first popularized in 1901 by the author H.G. Wells. He wrote a novel called The First Man in the Moon. Uh, it's a science fiction novel, and the term was used to describe any environment that does not include the surface of Earth. And by and large, it's still used in this same way today. In earlier lectures of this course, we learn about the Bawaka group, who are a group of academics and Yulanu knowledge holders from northeast Arnhem Land uh, in north central Australia. Um, and this Bawaka group, they actually challenge this term and the idea of outer space. They say that there is no such thing as outer space or outer country, that there is no outside and that what we do in one part of the country affects all other parts, really rejecting the idea that space has no relation to us. The term cosmos nullius refers to treating space as though it does not contain any life um, and is really an extension of the term terra nullius, which was a colonial tool used by Captain Cook and the British Empire to treat Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as less than human, uh, really justifying the dispossession of our lands. Interestingly, the Western idea that space is disconnected, um, this disconnected vacuum uh, that is void of life or ownership, is not a coincidence. Anthropologist Valeri Olson states that Indigenous studies and other critical studies of settler colonial outer spatiality uh, really analyse Western social and scientific fields and reveal how those fields perpetuate the concept of a cosmos nullius, within which Western definitions of life intelligence uh, and sociality standards are unexamined political inventions. So it's a bit complicated, but essentially what she's saying is that this idea that space is a void um, and void of intelligent or even unintelligent life uh, has been intentionally designed to assert political interest over such environments, just as terra nullius was used to claim Australia. This is not the only instance of this happening. Uh, for example, in the field of exoplanet research, which involves imaging or detecting planets outside our solar system, researchers often use the term new worlds to describe those planets. Interestingly, this is the same term used to describe the continent uh, of America in the 16th century by European explorers. In a letter to Prince John, written in 1500, Christopher Columbus claimed to have reached new heavens and world, and that he had placed another world under the dominion of the kings of Spain. A decade later, America was described as Nuevo Mundo, meaning New World, or was given the name America, after European settler Amerigo Vespucci argued that Columbus had reached a new continent and that had never been explored by Europeans up until this point in time. Here we see a an image of America made in 1561 by, German by a German cartographer, which describes America as Novus Orvis or New Spear of Lands. This framing led to the colonization of the lands and now referred to as the United States of America, with complete disregard for the native peoples and communities who had already been occupying those lands since time immemorial. And with this analysis, we start to see a pattern as to how these framings and terms are used by governments and scientific communities to assert a racial or cultural hierarchy over spaces and resources. 
But this is a relatively modern approach to space. As we have explored in these lectures and as we can see around the world, there are a multitude of ways in which people describe, connect and relate to the cosmos. Absolutely. Uh, I think this is really well summed up by anthropologist uh, Istvan Prayat, who writes about the Hopi people who are a Native American nation in the state of Arizona. He explains that Hopi pilgrims travel in a cosmos that was never conceived of as a totally alien space or a terra nullius or a cosmic web of wilderness but it's a cosmos stuffed with things one can relate to by ancient kin and old friends and by star beings. Here we see figures of these ancient kin uh, and the star beings and they're called the Kachinas and they're described by Hopi descendants as the spirits of all things in the universe. Uh, of rocks, of stars, animals, plants, and ancestors who have lived good lives. The Kachinas are said to climb down ladders that are made by the Hopi people here on Earth, um, and this is done during ceremony, uh, and they intend to join the Hopi people down here on the land. Similarly, here in Australia, many nations speak of the interconnectedness between the land and sky country. In the Gamilaroi culture, there's a special campsite in the sky positioned behind the, Wil the Milky Way, Warrambool, uh, and is where campsites, tribes, and ancestral places reside. On the land, in the Big Warrambool, is a floodplain located in southern Queensland that floods periodically. With each flood, the plains reflect the image of the sky above, acting as a portal between the land and the sky. Further south, in Victoria, a similar place is known in which a large pine tree acts as a portal intertwining people here on earth to the sky world, much like the Big Warrambool. The indigenous communities explored in this lecture do not use large technical instruments or spacecraft to connect with the sky and yet have valid experiences of the cosmos. On the one hand, we have governments and the scientific community treating space as though it's void of governance and as such is justifiably ours for exploring, exploiting and even terraforming Contrasting to this, we have indigenous communities around the world saying that not only is space occupied by many peoples and places, but these communities have had connections to the, these people and places for thousands of years. Historically, we have seen how our beliefs and languages determine how we treat foreign lands, entities and cultures, and ultimately whether we respect or exploit said spaces and peoples.